So welcome. Uh, thank you for waiting. And the, uh, this hearing of the Subcommittee on Immigration, Citizenship, Refugees, Border Security, and International Law uh, is now reconvening. We'd like to welcome everyone to the hearing. And uh, before we begin, I would like to recognize uh, that the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services performed extraordinarily uh, with just extra efforts in responding to the tragedy in Haiti following the January 12th earthquake. Two and a half months into the registration period, over 30,000 TPS applications have been filed. In addition, a USCIS's creation of a humanitarian parole policy specifically to deal with Haitian orphans in the process of adoption by U.S. citizens has allowed for nearly 1,000 orphans to travel safely to the United States. The agency has also processed a multitude of other humanitarian parole requests, including for Haitians in need of critical medical care and also allowing for escorts of U.S. citizen children from Haiti to family in the United States. And uh, finally, I would like to specifically recognize the heroic efforts of USCIS Haitian Field Office Director uh, Pius Banis and Officer Marie Briere, who worked around the clock for weeks following the earthquake to respond to the tragedy. Again, thank you for your efforts into responding to the crisis in Haiti. In this hearing, however, we will examine the funding structure for USCIS and the impact that it has on immigration law and policy. We'll also review the status of the agency's decade-long efforts to transform its business and technology processes. USCIS, and formerly the INS, have been primarily dependent on fees to fund uh, its adjudication operations since 1989. Between then and now, INS and later USCIS have raised fees for immigration and citizenship applications and petitions at a rate far exceeding the rate of inflation. For example, the fee for citizenship applications has increased from $90 in 1991 to $675 in 2007, an increase of 750 percent. The last time that USCIS raised its fees in 2007, it did so by an average of 86 percent. But just three years later, USCIS appears to be considering yet another increase in fees, and we hope to hear a little more about that. <coughs> in 2007, the subcommittee held two hearings on USCIS's most recent fee increase. At that time, I expressed my concerns about the enormous size of the increase and the methodology by which USCIS calculated the increase. I was especially worried about the barriers that such large fees would erect against legal immigrants who are elgi eligible to become U.S. citizens but may be unable to do so due to the high costs involved. At the, at the first hearing, then USCIS Director Emilio Gonzalez testified that the agency's new fee rules were carefully devised, and I quote, to ensure USCIS recovers its full business costs. At the second hearing, then Deputy Director, uh, Acting Director, Jock Sharpen testified that the new fees were designed to bring about greater efficiency and, he said, long-term cost reduction. And in the final fee rule, USCIS wrote that the new fee structure would enable USCIS to make improvements that may ultimately, and this is a quote, help avoid future increases and possibly reduce costs. But three years later, I'm concerned that USCIS is considering another fee increase instead of uh, reaping the benefits and reducing costs um, and, and, and reducing fees. It already costs $2,700 for a family of four to apply for citizenship. Another increase will make it that much more difficult for persons of limited means to become U.S. citizens. I hope to have a frank discussion with the witnesses in today's hearing about the financial health of USCIS and how to achieve the right mixture of funding streams for the agency through fees and appropriations. On a related note, USCIS and the former INS have been trying to transform information and business process, uh, processes for roughly a decade. And I, I know the new director is, is new on the job, uh, but the agency still continues to use a filing system that is predominantly paper-based. And with approximately 55 million files spread out over numerous offices across the country, in this day and age, it's hard to believe that any federal agency dealing with millions of files has not yet developed a primarily digital filing system. 
In 2005, the DHS Office of Inspector General reported that despite re repeated assessment and, and attempts to modernize, USCIS's processing of immigration benefits continued to be inefficient, hindering its ability to effectively carry out its mission. Processes then remained primarily paper-based and duplicative, resulting in an ineffective use of human and financial resources. IT software and hardware systems uh, were not well configured to meet U.S. Uh, users' needs. In the follow-up report in 2006, the IG observed that because of repeated changes in focus and direction, USCIS has tended to duplicate previous modern uh, modernization initiatives and has not demonstrated the ability to execute its planned strategies. Since 2007, the Immigration Subcommittee has actively worked with the Department and outside experts to out evaluate the agency's proposals for the transformation program. To date, however, the Subcommittee and outside observers have not found the transportation efforts uh, to have been successful yet. Uh, we uh, fear that they are, there is some problems perhaps, at least questions, about progress and the level of detail regarding actual transformation implementation, and so we hope to learn more today about that whole subject. Uh, I also want to mention that the subcommittee's last hearing following the USCIS fee increase rule on September 20, 2007, we again raised significant concerns about the progress of the transformation efforts, and we had a follow-up report in July of last year from uh, the IG uh, that did find that the transformation efforts were ineffective and plagued with problems. Now, we need to examine what steps have been taken and can be taken to bring USCIS into the 21st century. The stakes are very high, and uh, the agency just cannot continue to be buried in a sea of paper if a digital solution is available. I know that the director is committed to modernization efforts. I know that he agrees with me that we can't just work faster, we have to work smarter to get this done, and so I look forward to his testimony on what we've done and what we need to do and how the subcommittee can help uh, the agency uh, in that effort. I do know that you um, inherited uh, something of a, of a mess, and uh, we do hope that you are successful in, in cleaning uh, the technology scene uh, up. And with that, I will uh, yield to the uh, ranking member, Steve King, for his opening statement. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. The immigrants who will enjoy the priceless benefits of living and working in America should have to pay for the costs the U.S. government incurs on their behalf. <coughs> the American taxpayers should not have to foot the bill for granting highly sought-after immigration benefits. While I agree that our nation has been much enriched by legal immigration, in fact, skimmed the cream of the crop off of every donor civilization to build the foundation for the American spirit with their vitality, that given the competing needs for new tax dollars and any tax dollars, it only makes sense that those who directly receive an individual immigration benefit should pay for it, fee for service, so to speak. The ability to become a naturalized citizen is the greatest benefit a country can bestow. Indeed, it is priceless. Therefore, USCIS should structure its application processing fees to recover its full costs. The new fee schedule that USCIS instituted in 2007 was based on a comprehensive fee study conducted at the recommendation of the Government Accountability Office. Although the fee increases were substantial in some categories, that does not necessarily make them excessive. Full cost recovery includes more than the direct cost of providing services. It covers overhead and support costs such as the cost of personnel and their retirement benefits, it facil it fa their facilities and litigation. Most importantly, it includes the cost of background checks and fraud detection, both of which are critical to ensuring that immigration benefits are granted to those who deserve them and not to those who plan to do us harm. USCIS pledged that part of the new fees would go to pay for the enhanced security and integrity of the immigration system. They were to fund 170 additional fraud detection and national security agents to oversee fraud investigations and the processing of applications that have national security concerns. I hope to learn that these agents were in fact hired this hearing today. But it is not unprecedented for criminals and terrorists to try to enter the U.S. through legal channels. 
Mahmoud Abu Halima, a terrorist who blew up the World Trade Center in 1993, received amnesty through the 1986 immigration bill. Further, 9-11 hijackers came into the U.S. on student and visitor visas. We have tragically, as we have tragically learned, through background checks, they are especially critical to immigrant processing. <coughs> Immigration benefit fraud remains a critical issue. In 2006, the GAO found that individuals who pose a threat to national security and public safety may seek to enter the United States by fraudulently obtaining immigration benefits. It determined that, although the full extent of benefit fraud is not known, available evidence suggests that it is an ongoing and serious problem. USCIS's Office of Fraud Detection and National Security found that an astounding 33% of religious worker visa applications were fraudulent. And for some denominations, a majority of the applications were fraudulent, and by recollection, it seems to me that all of the applications from an individual country were fraudulent. Yet GAO found that immigration adjudicators it interviewed reported that communication from management did not clearly communicate to them the importance of fraud control. Rather, it emphasized meeting production goals designed to reduce the backlog of applications almost exclusively. Close quote. GAO concluded that the, the lack of a clear strategy for how and when to punish fraud perpetrators limits DHS's ability to project a convincing message that those who commit fraud face a credible threat of punishment. Close quote. Last year, GAO reported that fraud detection and prevention accounted for only four and one quarter percent of USCIS's annual expenditures for application processing. And just last October, DHS's Office of the Inspector General found that the Office of Fraud Detection and National Security, quote, has had little measurable effect on benefit fraud, close quote. The Inspector General cited a lack of incentives such as in employee evaluations for USCIS personnel to combat, uh, to combat fraud as opposed to simply rubber stamping applications to improve productivity. Director Mayorkas, while these findings are disturbing, I am heartened that you have elevated the fraud detection to a newly established fraud detection and national security directorate that will report directly to you, demonstrating in your words, and I'll quote them, our continued commitment to eliminating fraud, identifying national security threats, and sharing information with our law enforcement intelligence par and intelligence partners, close quote. Your continued commitment is indeed crucial, and uh, I appreciate that commitment that you've demonstrated. The balance of the increased fee re revenue was promised to go to modernizing the technology and business structure of USCIS and improving the delivery of services. We will find out today how well this transformation has gone. I think we do understand the importance of the, um, of the investigative component, especially of USCIS. And, and, we, and I believe that uh, we had set the foundation for fee-for-service, and that was a consensus this Congress had voted for. And I'm hopeful that whatever we do with the fee structure in the future, it is based on fee-for-services and not taxing American taxpayers who are overtaxed, overstressed, overburdened, and over-indebted uh, especially with the acceleration of the government spending that we've had. They simply cannot fund out of the taxpayer dollars applications that are fee-for-service for a service that benefits individuals uh, that can, in spite of the cost, need to find a way to use their own revenue. So I uh, look forward to your testimony. I appreciate this hearing, Madam Chair, and I reel back the balance of my time. We are pleased to have the um, chairman of the Judiciary Committee with us this afternoon, Mr. Carnes. It's an honor to have you here, and I would welcome your opening statement if, should you wish to uh, give one. Thank you, Chairwoman. And to my good friend Steve King uh, and the members of the committee, I um, haven't been to this kind of a hearing before, uh, and I wanted to begin as we examine the the United States uh, Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS, by commending Director Mayorkas <clears throat> about the diligent way that they've uh, acted in terms of the Haiti earthquake. I've, I've done a lot of work with that country and its people, and you moved in right away uh, uh, in the issue of granting temporary protective status, and uh, you uh, 
done some hum uh, Haitian adoptions through humanitarian parole. And it's just impressive. And I think you're living up to your informal record on the Hill as a pretty effective administrator, and I commend you for it. Now the um, fee increases and the paperwork burdens are two other challenges that you're faced with. Now, occasionally Steve King and I disagree, and this is one of those instances, because I don't want the, uh, these uh, costs to be continually heaped on the applicant. Uh, maybe I'll find out here at this hearing and uh, it may give Steve and I an opportunity to work on this issue together, but there are applicants otherwise qualified to apply for citizenship that don't have the money. They can't afford it. Uh, some of them are not working at uh, too good a jobs to begin with. So. I just want to try to get a picture of this. Um, uh, fee increases should be absorbed by the appropriations process. Uh, good night. W when you got a trillion dollar budgets and we're talking about uh, charging each person, what is it? 500, 625, 600. $675 each. A family of four. Uh, do you know how many people uh, apply for citizenship and never can follow through because they can't afford it? They're otherwise qualified. And so I'm for putting these uh, fees into the appropriations process. But I don't even want a fee increase. This floating, this rumor about a tiny increase, don't worry. Look, as uh, Zoloft and said, the, the, the costs, the, the increases have been astronomic already. So we don't need that. Uh, we don't de need it as far as I'm concerned. Now the paperwork problem. Uh, here we are. We've been we've been getting computers, and we've been we're going to digitize uh, all the paperwork, which can only occasionally get lost. But uh, one of your pre predecessors, Eduardo Aguirre, uh, worked on this. Emilio Gonzalez then came along, and he gave it his best shot. Jack Schwarf did the job, and now here you are. And what I think a number of us on the committee are concerned with is what is the problem? What makes it so difficult to realize that without computerizing this information, uh, papers have to be sent back and forth from one office to the other. They're frequently lost. Uh, besides your sympathy, I, I want you to present a plan or construct one that will really take care of the technology transformation that so long uh, had uh, all of your predecessors have tried and and frank quite frankly have not been that successful so let's let's see where we go today and i look forward madam chair to the hearings thank you um mr conyers and should mr uh, smith arrive we would be pleased to accept the statement at that time but in the interest of proceeding to our witnesses 
Uh, I would ask other members to submit their statements for the record within five legislative days and without objection. All opening statements will be placed in the record and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess of the hearing at any time. I'd like to introduce the witnesses. First, it's my pleasure to introduce Alejandro Mayorkas. Mr. Mayorkas was nominated to be the Director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services by President Obama on April 24, 2009, less than one year ago. He was unanimously confirmed by the United States Senate on August 7, 2009. Director Mayorkas has served as the United States Attorney for the Central District of California and previously was a partner in the law firm of O'Melveny and Myers. Last year, he was named one of the 50, 50 most influential minority lawyers in America by the National Law Journal. Director Mayorkas previously served as an assistant U.S. attorney for the Central District of California from 1989 to 98. He holds a Juris Doctorate degree from Loyola Law School and a bachelor's degree from the University of California at Berkeley. Next, I'd like to introduce Frank Deffer. Mr. Deffer joined the Office of Inspector General for the Department of Homeland Security in March of 2003. He previously served as Director, Information Management Division in the Office of Audits at the Department of State and at the Office of Inspector General for the Broadcast Board of Governors. Before joining the State Department from 1984 to 1998, he served in a number of positions at the U.S. General Accounting Office and while at the GAO, he directed audits of defense and government-wide information technology acquisition programs as an assistant director in the Accounting and Information Management Division and produced dozens of reports for Congress. He is a graduate of Pennsylvania State University where he earned both his Bachelor's of Arts and Master's of Arts degree in political science. Mr. Deffer is also retired from the U.S. Army Reserve where he last served as a major in the Medical Service uh, Corps. Finally, I'd like to introduce Susan Irving. Ms. Irving is a director for the Federal Budget Analysis within Strategic Issues at the GAO. She oversees work on federal budget structure, the congressional budget process, user fees, U.S. fiscal position, long-term fiscal outlook and debt, and debt management. Prior to joining the GAO in 1989, Ms. Irving held a number of positions in and out of government largely concerned with economic and budget policy. She served as a legislative assistant and legislative director to members of the Senate Finance Committee and as staff director to the President's Council of Economic Advisors in the Executive Office of the President and as vice president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Ms. Irving has also been a fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard and has taught public management at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. She holds a BA in United States Studies from Wellesley College and an MPP and PhD in Public Policy from Harvard University. She's a native of Washington, D.C., where she resides with her husband and son. Now, your written statements will be, paid, me, me, be made part of the record in their entirety. We ask that you summarize your written statement in about five minutes. We have a system of lights here, that little machine on the desk will be green until four minutes have gone by and then it will turn yellow and when it turns red it means you've actually spoken for five minutes it always comes as a shock we won't cut you off mid-sentence but we would ask that you try and summarize at that point so that members will have an opportunity to ask uh, questions and so now we will proceed with the testimony and we'll begin with you director Mayorkas. please begin Thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Lofgren, Ranking Member King, and members of the subcommittee. It is a privilege for me to appear before you today. On behalf of our entire agency, thank you for your continued strong support of the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services and its programs. I look forward to testifying today about the state of the U.S. CIS and to providing you an overview of our key initiatives and accomplishments, including our current financial condition and progress of the agency's transformation program. Each of the actions we are undertaking serves our agency's guiding principles of integrity, efficiency, consistency, and transparency. Our agency faces several operational and management challenges. The inherent challenges in our immigration system have led us to improve operational transparency, begin initiatives to create consistency and predictability in agency actions, strengthen community outreach, and improve customer service functions. To enhance our national security and the integrity of our immigration system, we have established a new directorate devoted exclusively to fraud detection and national security 
and developed improved safeguards and security measures in our operations. The consistent decline in our revenue underscores the importance of developing new and greater efficiencies. This is acutely significant for us as an agency funded primarily by applicants and petitioners' fees. We have a tremendous responsibility to be careful stewards of the funds we receive. In recognition of the difficulties of our financial situation, upon my arrival, I immediately called for an exhaustive and vigorous review of the agency's annual operating plan. The review remains underway, and already we have identified cuts exceeding $160 million. Our USCIS budget request for fiscal year 2011 reflects both cost and fee financing adjustments in response to the current economic climate and the corresponding projected decrease in fee revenue. By the end of this fiscal year, we will be publishing the results of our fee study required by the Chief Financial Officers Act, which will indicate any projected changes to the amounts we charge for our services. We understand that the communities we serve include individuals without significant financial means. We are making every effort to honor this concern amidst our difficult financial circumstances. Our outdated information technology infrastructure has led us to reassess how we operate so that we can move more quickly from a paper-based workplace to one that is account-centric and more reliant on electronic information. Challenges indeed present opportunities, and these opportunities in the hands of the men and women of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services will mean a stronger and brighter future for our agency and for the public we serve. There can be no stronger recent example of this than the dedication and skill our personnel exhibited in the tragic wake of the January 12th earthquake in Haiti. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman, for recognizing our work in this regard. Working tirelessly and selflessly day and night, our workforce brought hundreds of Haitian orphans to safety and humanitarian relief to thousands of Haitian nationals in our country who could not return safely to their homeland. What we have done since January 12th and what we continue to do is a shining example of our abilities and our potential. While USCIS has made vast improvements in both customer service and reduced processing times, USCIS also faces significant challenges that it is working to overcome. I look forward to working with you on these and other matters critical to the transparency, integrity, consistency, and efficiency of our work at USCIS and of the immigration system we help administer. Your demands and expectations help further define our goals and our aspirations. I am privileged to be before you today. I look forward to working with you and to answering your questions as best I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Deffer. Madam Chairwoman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services efforts to transform its business and modernize the information technology used to support that business. With immigration reform now back on the legislative agenda, this is an important issue to address. My testimony today will address the need for USCIS transformation and IT modernization, progress made thus far, and will identify critical challenges to successful transformation and IT modernization. USCIS has recognized that its paper-based processes hindered its ability to verify the identity of applicants, efficiently process immigration benefits, and provide other agencies with relevant information on possible criminals and terrorists. In 2005, USCIS embarked on an enterprise-wide transformation program to transition its fragmented paper-based operational environment to a centralized and consolidated operational environment using electronic adjudication. Since then, it has made progress in a number of areas. Specifically, USCIS has established the Transformation Program Office to oversee all transformation initiatives within USCIS. Also, it has developed an acquisition strategy to provide a roadmap for the agency to acquire the resources, such as program support and IT services, necessary to implement the transformation. USCIS awarded a contract for a transformation IT service provider referred to as a, the Solutions Architect in November 2008. Further, USCIS has made progress in strengthening IT management to support the agency's mission and its transformation efforts. 
specifically USA has developed a new organizational structure to facilitate IT services and it has realigned field IT staff under the CIO. Still, it, C, USCIS faces a number of critical challenges as it moves forward with transformation and IT modernization. First and foremost, it is critical that transformation and IT modernization receive the full support of USCIS executive leadership, starting with the director. As the champion for transformation, the director and his leadership team can ensure that the program has sufficient resources while at the same time providing strong oversight to keep the program on track. Business process reengineering is also key to the success of transformation. Without effective business process reengineering, USCIS risks developing new IT systems that support ineffective and outdated processes. Also critical to the success of transformation will be a strong partnership between TPO and the, and the CIO. USCIS business units and IT stakeholders need to be closely aligned in setting the direction and managing the transformation effort. A strong partnership between TPO and the CIO can help ensure that new IT systems are developed in accordance with life cycle development standards, are tested fully, and meet IT security standards. In conclusion, over the past five years, USCIS has elevated the transformation program to an agency-wide priority to more efficiently and effectively meet its mission of administering the nation's immigration laws. Moving forward, in addition to addressing current operational needs, USCIS must also prepare for potential increases in benefits, process, and workloads that could result from proposed immigration reform legislation. Consequently, transformation will be critical to support the agency's current workload and prepare for potential future increases in demand for immigration benefits processing. Madam Chairman, this concludes my prepared statement. I appreciate your time and attention and welcome any questions from you or members of the subcommittee. Thank you very much. And finally, we'll turn to Dr. Irving for her testimony. Um, Madam Chair, um, Mr. Casey, Ms. Chu, um, thank you for inviting me to talk and stand back a little bit from the operations of a specific agency to talk about user fees and the funding structure as it applies to USCIS. The decision to fund an agency either partially or fully through fees is fundamentally a policy decision. But we in CAO developed a user design guide to help identify the issues, the questions, and trade-offs that must be confronted in creating a workable and effective fee structure. We talk about several stages in the fee process, the setting of the fee, collecting it, how the agency may use the fee, and the reviewing of the fee, which strikes me as being very important to you. We look against the criteria against which you bump up a fee, equity, efficiency, revenue adequacy, and administrative burden. I'd like to focus today on setting of the fee. It's the mo among the most challenging because you have to both determine the costs and determine who shall pay them. It highlights one of the more complicated issues in the criteria, which is that of equity. At one level, we all think equity is quite easy. We should all pay our fair share. We think of that in many areas of American law. But what is the fair share? This is just an illustrative picture of the question of the beneficiary should pay. Again, stepping back from one critical the issue of just USCIS, for many of the fee-funded operations in this country, there is not an identity between user and beneficiary. I'm going to give you a boringly simple illustration on this, which I used before the trans one of the transportation committees once when we were talking about next generation air traffic. And I suggested that if I never get on an airplane, I benefit if they don't fall out of the sky, which means that it's a more complicated issue for all of you, which is how much of NGAT should be funded by user fees paid by current flyers. Sometimes we, so this, this issue of the circle, who's the identified beneficiary ver user versus other beneficiaries is a policy call that is on a continuum. We range from things like, um, um, like you did with immigration to food inspection, air traffic, parks, even the funding of our roads. On the other side, once we have identified the identified beneficiaries, the question becomes how do we allocate the cost to them? Let me point out to you that the existence of exemptions and waivers makes this more complicated. 
if you have a fully fee funded operation and through policy grounds and a directive from the congress there are people who are exempted from paying that fee but who still receive the service you have to find some way to cover their costs again outside just the u s c i s example if i fly into this country from paris i pay that seventeen dollars and fifty cents you see at the end of your ticket covers my inspection for agriculture for customs and for immigration if i fly in from the olympics in vancouver i do not pay the customs portion of that fee but those of you have been in from canada know you are inspected that means some other user must cover the cost of that inspection assigning costs therefore brings to play both cost analysis and equity at one level i'd like to say i think the three bucket approach uses used in its last fee review is not unreasonable first were form specific costs that can be attributed to specific applicants second is overhead or what i might call the cost of having the agency there to exist that is the pencils the paper the uh, the office heat um, all of that there are a number of ways to do that consistent with accounting standards in our review we raised some concerns about their documentation and level of detail but allocating that across other payers is not an unreasonable approach finally as you all know there is a surcharge imposed for the cost of exemptions and waivers what appeals to me as an analyst about I isolating and identifying the surcharge is it provides to the policymaker the congress of the united states the cost of their decision to exempt something once there is an exemption um, as i said you have only two choices that can be other fee payers can ca carry that cost or they can be a decision made to provide general revenues for that you cannot prevent cross subsidization unless you either provide general revenues or you provide that people who are exempt from paying are also exempt from the service which generally we don't want to do finally i want to say something about revenue adequacy this is especially important for fee funded agencies they need a carry over balance you need something and to get to the right carry over balance the agency needs to conduct an analysis about what makes its fee revenue fluctuate the down and that and we ding them a little bit on that frankly i want to just mention that infrequent reviews are likely to lead to larger fee increases we all notice how big the increase was in 07 but we don't notice that there were no increases between the last review and that i'm sorry to have been the one witness who hit the red light <laughs> madam chair that was very interesting thank you all for your testimony and now we'll begin um, our questions and um, depending on what's going on in the floor maybe we'll have a chance to do two rounds um, I'd like to begin and start uh, with you mr. director uh, about the fee issue and really the issues that dr. Irving has uh, mentioned the USCIS has requested and received appropriations for certain other enforcement type activities for example e verify and save and I'm thinking about the um, fraud detection national security directive I gather and I don't disagree that your creation and elevation of this function uh, is an important one we have to have and you know integrity you listed that first among the agency values but it seems to me that that might be a good candidate um, for an appropriation because just as with other law enforcement activities you don't necessarily um, you know, charge that off against a refugee admission or an adoption. Uh, do you have a comment on that, or are you allowed to comment on that? Um, <laughs> Madam Chairwoman, uh, those are two different questions. They are. Me now, Maybe but, uh, I should ask the first uh, one first. I'm going to answer. I'm going to answer the first one, uh, and that is that the issue of whether the fraud detection national security responsibility that our agency has is one that should be executed with an appropriation rather than the fee-for-services model is, I think, a policy question that is worthy of discussion. Uh, we have indeed sought in the fiscal year 2011 budget uh, uh, an appropriation for our E-Verify program and for the uh, SAVE program, uh, both of which are um, integrity tools, uh, if you will. And so I understand the uh, chairwoman's uh, question with respect to the fraud detection national security. Thank you. I think that's a fair response and one that really probably the 
subcommittee needs to discuss or perhaps even the full committee i would like to get into the question of the um, transformation and the details um, five minutes is not enough to talk about the details i realize that but the oig um, report highlighted that the transformation efforts uh, to date have focused primarily on high-level business processes and uh, various alternatives to implement transformation. We spent a fair amount of money, most of it spent before you were on the job, I might add, 117 million spent since 2005, but it's not clear what benchmarks we're meeting, what technology is actually being deployed, what business engineering processes have been changed to make it work. Is it um, possible for you to give us some expectation of how, when and how we might expect that detail from your department? It, not necessarily in a hearing, but in a report or, or a briefing. Are there benchmarks that can be uh, provided and then that we could look to to hold the agency accountable for? Uh, most certainly, uh, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Um, we will provide uh, this committee um, uh, uh, with a, a report that identifies uh, the benchmarks that we currently have in place for the immediate future and for the longer term future of the transformation effort. And uh, we do believe in such a um, uh, undertaking of considerable breadth that benchmarks are, are pivotal to the success. And one thing I would like to um, uh, comment, if I may, Madam Chairwoman, is that I think the request for this uh, hearing served a tremendous uh, purpose for me personally as the director of the agency in, in establishing a, a very important, uh, hopefully what will be a regularized line of communication with the Office of Inspector General given uh, the breadth and depth of that office's knowledge of our transformation effort, uh, its knowledge of um, uh, the problems that we have encountered in the past and hopefully the path we're paving to success. And so I think that's a, a wonderful byproduct uh, of the request for this hearing. But we will provide uh, to this committee uh, a, a schedule uh, that uh, we intend to honor. I, I'd just like to say, Doc, uh, Director Mayorkas, that is the first time in my entire service in Congress that a member of the administration has thanked a committee for holding a hearing and said it was useful. So that is a thrill to me, <laughs> and I appreciate it very much. And um, uh, <coughs> I'm, well, I'm just glad to hear that. Um, I, I want to ask about something I think I know the answer to, but I, I, I want to explore it further. We had a huge backlog when you were um, confirmed on uh, I-130 <coughs> petitions. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I don't really know, but millions. I think it's down to around six or 700,000, not that that isn't a substantial amount. You have plans to reduce that backlog. I'd like to know what are they, when do we think those backlogs will be done, and further, um, as we look at um, how we could reform our immigration laws, make them work better, having details actually to a snapshot really would help inform us to make decisions in terms of age of beneficiaries and and relationships and the like will we be able to get a yield on that kind of information as you work through this backlog uh, thank you madam chairwoman uh, we have distributed the uh, i-130 caseload throughout our offices across the country uh, in light of the um, significance uh, of that caseload. We anticipate that the majority of the caseload will be worked through uh, by the end of fiscal year 2010 this year, and we uh, intend to complete the processing of all the I-130s currently pending by the first quarter of fiscal year 2011. And so that caseload has already been distributed throughout the field across the country for uh, adjudication. With respect to our ability to um, slice and dice, if you will, uh, the data that is so important to our agency and to this committee. Uh, we can do that now manually. One of the um, benefits that we'll receive from the transformation uh, is indeed the ability to assess that 
uh, data and to collect it and to uh, analyze it in real time by virtue of the electronic environment. I appreciate that so much, and uh, my light, uh, red light is on, so I will turn now to the ranking member for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank you for this hearing and uh, for the witnesses, and especially for the gratitude of the witnesses for having the hearing. Um, I would uh, direct uh, first to uh, Director Mayorkas. The, um, you, you made a comment, it's, the, it's in your written testimony at least, that it's the, your customers that you serve are the, those who file immigration and naturalization applications. And I just ask you if you could reflect upon that. Um, the applicants as your customers as opposed to the uh, American public and we're here discussing whether it's their fees, uh, the applicants fees that will be um, picking up the slack so to speak or whether it will be the American taxpayer. So would you care to clarify that? Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Congressman. Uh, customer is a, a particular term that I am uh, not fond of. Uh, it speaks of a um, a barter relationship um, and uh, the work of our agency is uh, more fundamental than that. Um, and so uh, we are indeed looking for a different term. Uh, I view the term customer for the time being as pertaining to the individual who in fact is seeking a benefit from our agency. Very different from the term that I use that is more encompassing which is a stakeholder. A uh, stakeholder includes the customer, includes the general public, includes the law enforcement community, and is a very, uh, um, uh, more, it's a more encompassing term. And well, uh, thanks for that clarification, and I, and I do agree with that. It, it goes across the spectrum uh, and uh, focusing on the interests of uh, the United States of America. And um, I've made a point in my uh, opening uh, statement about 170 fraud detection and national security agents. Uh, how are you doing on that? Um, uh, Congressman, since uh, um, uh, that statement, uh, we have indeed, I believe, hired uh, more than 200 uh, individuals um, uh, who are uh, devoted to the fraud detection and national security effort. That's good news. Thank you, Director. And then um, <coughs> the uh, I would say it was stated that the GAO found that USCIS immigration adjudicators had interviewed, and then I would pick up, this is a quote from the GAO report, um, reported that communication from management did not clearly communicate to them the importance of fraud control, rather it emphasized meeting production goals designed to reduce the backlog of applications almost exclusively, close quote. Would you care to speak to that statement out of the GAO report as to how you'd react to that and how you'd like to characterize it? Congressman, I can only speak of my efforts and the ethics uh, that characterize our agency today. And I can say that the importance of our fraud detection national security uh, work is well understood uh, by everyone throughout our agency. I have underscored it as well. And the focus on production goals not only has at a, as a potential expense our fraud detection and national security work, but it also has as a potential expense uh, the rights of the customers who come before us. Uh, thank you, Director. And I, and I hear that, that focus uh, back on the security as, uh, as opposed to the just simply processing a number through and, uh, and scoring according to the number of applications processed. And then I would just... Um, I direct also your attention to the uh, the IG's report at, um, that that makes a recommendation that there be more site visits to the the religious workers site site visits to verify. I know that that was an initiative that was picked up when we discovered the fraud in the religious workers visas component of this, and the recommendation of the IG that that be accelerated. I don't have the exact quotes in front of me here, but add site visits. Have you taken steps on that, or do you have comments about the Inspector General's recommendation? Congressman, the administrative site visit verification program is underway, and we have plans to continue it in fiscal year 2010. And has it been an increase at the recommendation of IG? Um, I would have to get back to you with respect okay. to um, its um, scope, uh, Congressman. I, I would like to, um, if I can, just uh, share with you a thought that is born not of my experience 
uh, as the Director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services because I am only seven months into my tenure. But if I can um, draw upon my 12 years of experience as a federal prosecutor, nine as an assistant U.S. attorney, almost three as, um, as a United States attorney, more or bigger is not necessarily better. I think the key to a verification, a visit verification program, its effectiveness is ensuring that it is uh, well targeted, uh, that it is strategic in nature. That is not necessarily to say that it should not um, grow, uh, but we want to make sure uh, that we are, uh, that we have the proper foundation, the proper strategic framework in place, and then build from there. Uh, I thank will look you, at Director, that. and you're watching this clock down. I really had one more subject I'd like to get to, if the Chair would indulge me. With um, unanimous consent and additional minute for the gentleman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was anxious to get down to the, um, the E-Verify component of this, and I'm, I'm curious as to what you might like to tell this panel. I'm, uh, I'm seeing progress in E-Verify. I'm seeing that the accuracy of it uh, goes up. If I remember from your written testimony, 96% accuracy or 90 and uh, but what, I, what I'm interested in is uh, the if there is an effort to um, work in cooperation with the Social Security Administration and uh, identify the duplicate or the multiple use of Social Security numbers, and if you could tell us also uh, in, in the same response from a time perspective, uh, what you're able to do with uh, digital photographs attached uh, to the E-Verify records to in order to provide a, uh, I'll say, a visual biometric, uh, just to give us a sense of what's going on there with E-Verify. Thank you very much, Congressman. Uh, um, you correctly uh, cite to my written testimony with respect to the improved accuracy rate of the E-Verify program, a critical tool in ensuring the lawfulness of the workplace. Uh, we have worked with not only Social Security Administration, but other departments within the administration uh, to uh, increase the use of uh, biometric information to Im further improve the accuracy of the E-Verify program. We use uh, photographs from the Department of Homeland Security database, uh, U.S. visit, and we will soon be utilizing uh, passport photographs from the Department of State by way of example. Driver's licenses? Uh, we do not yet have um, that full functionality across the country. Uh, we hope to achieve that over time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, Thank you, Director. The witness. time has expired. I turn now to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Gutierrez. Thank you, um, Madam Chairwoman. Um, pleasure to have you all here before us. Um, for just following up on the gentleman from Iowa's question, um, if 100 people showed up and underwent E-Verify and they were all undocumented, that is to say, they were unqualified to work, they weren't authorized to work, how many of them would ultimately be verified uh, and given a clearance to continue working? Uh, Congressman, the, uh, the Westat study uh, that has received... Uh, the Westat study that you pay to have done? Correct. Okay. Uh, the, the Westat study uh, that uh, has been uh, discussed uh, at considerable uh, amount uh, in recent days, reported that, um, putting aside, if I may, the statistical uh, standard uh, deviation for uh, error rate and its methodology, um, indicated that the E-Verify program would accurately capture the um, uh, unauthorized uh, that uh, perpetrated, that are sought to perpetrate uh, identity fraud 46% of the time. Okay. So 54% of the time it doesn't do it. So 54 out of every 100 people. So if I were to go to a I'm sorry, I, I reversed it. I think it's 54% of the Good. time. Great. You yeah. know, let's not split hairs here. 100 people, all of them undocumented, decide I'm fearless. E-Verify is here to rein me in. I'm going to go through the process of E-Verify. The fact is, half of them, if they do it on Friday, show up to work on Monday. All good, ready to go, like nothing happened. That's how great the E-Verify system is. Let me just go on to other questions. Have you encountered a Muslim Islamic buildup 
that would threaten this country within the religious visa program? Within the religious worker? Yeah, religious program. worker. With uh, visa program. Congressman, that is a question to which I do not have the answer well, today. You should look into it because there have been allegations made before this committee in the past about just such a situation, uh, which, of course, uh, we can't turn a blind eye to. We should look into those allegations. And if they're false, we should certainly uh, state that they're false. Uh, let me ask, everyone has to pay for the citizenship processing fee, and the fee must include all of the salaries and all of the expenses of your agency. Those fees must cover all of that. Is that correct? Uh, for those um, who are required to pay a fee, um, the cost uh, does include uh, agency overhead. Okay. So th they, they pay for it. There's, there's no government assistance here or government um, um, uh, well, funded process here, right? There are, there are uh, certain groups of people that as a matter of policy Congress has determined uh, would not um, look, have to pay. And who are they? Uh, for example, uh, to s a limited extent, refugees and asylees, and for the fiscal year 2011 budget, we have sought a greater appropriation to further relieve uh, that uh, disadvantaged uh, group uh, from paying a fee that they can ill afford. Um, we also have a fee waiver uh, program um, uh, that does assess the inability to pay and uh, does seek to extend a benefit to an individual that might not let otherwise me, be able to afford let me, it. But, it. But in essence, you're a fee-driven agency. We are. Thank you. I, I should have just asked the question that way. But there are people that don't pay. So the people that do pay subsidize the ones that don't, right? Yes. Like if you're a soldier. Yes, you unless... Right, you're a soldier, you don't have to pay. Unless right? there's an appropriate You're in a site, you don't have to pay. But the other ones have to pay because when that soldier gets processed, the American taxpayer doesn't help defray the cost of his citizenship application. The other people that participate in your citizenship program defray the cost and subsidize the cost. Is that accurate? Yes. Good. You see, because I'd be happy to help defray the cost of that soldier. And I always, may I ask for additional minute? Without objection, the gentleman is authorized for an addition. Yeah, I'd, I'd kind of be happy to pay. I'm sure they are too. But it's just as the fees continue to mount and to mount and to mount, I think we have a responsibility to those soldiers. We have a responsibility to those asylees. And I'd just like to, to, um, to state a quote and see if, if you agree with this quote. Um, I've always pledged to be your partner as we work to fix our immigration system. And that's a commitment that I reaffirm today. Nobody knows the cost of inaction better than you. You see it in the families that are torn apart and the small business owners who tried to do the right thing while others gamed the system. You see it in the workers who, sir, who deserve the protection of our laws and the officers who struggle to keep our community safe while earning the trust of those that serve. That was uh, your boss, President Barack Obama. Your boss also said when he was a U.S. Senator and introduced legislation jointly with this member, I got to stay in the House, I didn't get the promotion. But before he went on to the White House, and you should seriously look at it, not having everybody defray the cost of others and making sure that we're all there. So I hope you take a look at that legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I, uh, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez, is now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate that USCIS has looked for cost-cutting measures and is implementing them before raising fees again or requesting additional appropriations. And you mentioned in your testimony that USCIS has identified cuts to the tune of about $170 million. Is that correct? Uh, uh, th those are the amount. That is the approximate amount underway. Okay. Can you give me an overview of what those budget cuts would consist of? If I can. Um, Madam Congresswoman, give you some examples. Um, we have um, 
reduced our uh, allocated workforce by over 300 people. We have reduced overtime uh, by approximately 90 percent. Uh, we have cut travel costs. We have centralized our training programs. Those would be uh, just a few examples that come immediately to mind. Okay, so um, with respect to the staffing issues, um, if I'm hearing you correctly, that there are some staff that um, what are going to be let go or their hours cut or clearly the overtime uh, is cut. I'm sorry. We have reduced the contractor staff by, I believe, approximately 200 spots or, or perhaps more. Have, have not have, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the, the contractor spots, are those being filled by in-house hires or they're just being eliminated? Uh, they're being eliminated. We are not filling um, uh, certain federal vacancies. My, my concern is that it's, it's admirable that you're trying to cut costs. Uh, before you raise fees, because we certainly don't want to see people priced out of the American dream. But uh, on the other hand, when you're cutting positions uh, and a, a lot of the casework that we see in my district office suggests that the backlogs that currently exist are lengthy and in fact, in, in some cases, kind of ridiculous, uh, my fear is that now you want to cu cut, cut costs um, but then services will also be cut, and the wait, line, wait times may become even longer. Is that, have you considered that fully? Uh, we, we most certainly uh, have, and I appreciate uh, the question, and I appreciate the concern. Um, it is our intention, and uh, I should be held accountable to this, uh, that the cuts that we have made will not impose upon the quality of the service. Uh, we are hope to and are focused upon achieving greater efficiencies to ensure that our level of service uh, uh, remains high and hopefully, in fact, improves uh, despite <coughs> the economic challenges we face. To not uh, make the reductions in force, to not um, uh, undertake the cost-saving measures that we have would lead to uh, a perhaps even more difficult conversation uh, with those who uh, are very concerned about the ac accessibility of immigration benefits uh, to those who uh, seek them uh, who are financially challenged. Okay. Um, do you still expect completion of non-immigrant services under the transformation model by um, October of 2012? Or is that uh, yes, yes, we do, and we actually um, anticipate in fiscal year 2011 um, the first stage of making the non, uh, certain non-immigrant uh, visas um, uh, available in the transformed environment. So 2012, we anticipate all of non-immigrant visa classification. Okay, and you expect that that will happen. Um, I'm interested in knowing, um, since the system is fee-based, um, the number of people in the system or utilizing the system and the fees that they pay sort of affects the services that everybody receives. Is that not correct to some degree? The fees that people, y yes. Okay, so if, for example, there is a dramatic decline in the number of people who apply, that would affect your bottom line and your ability to service the people that are currently in the pipeline. Is that not correct? It, um, it is precisely what we have uh, endured in 2009 and are enduring now, which is a decline in the number of applications and therefore corresponding revenue. I mean, is there any way, is there any modeling that you do or any uh, way that you can predict what the number of applicants will be for any given year? Or are you just sort of subject to the whims of those who apply or don't apply? And um, I, I'd ask unanimous consent for an additional minute. We could you take 30 seconds because we have two seconds. more members before. Certainly, um, certainly. Uh, we work very hard uh, to forecast uh, anticipated workloads uh, in the agency realignment uh, that um, we performed uh, but several months ago. One of the things that we did was create an office of performance and quality. One of the functions of that office is indeed to engage with our chief financial officer and other personnel um, 
uh, projections uh, of anticipated workload. So we do not leave it to when we do the best we can. Okay. I realize you have a daunting task, but again, I'm g going to make the plea that um, raising those fees really does price people out of the system. And at the same time, there's a huge concern with, I, I know you want to cut costs, but cutting service and, and potentially causing those that are waiting in line patiently and who have been even further delays is a, is a tremendous concern because members of Congress deal with that on the, on the case work end. And with that, I will uh, thank the chairman Gentle and uh, yield back. Gentlelady's time has expired. Ms. Chu has been here from the beginning of the hearing and is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I have great concerns about uh, this increase in the fee, and um, I saw that um, there has been an increase that is far above the cost of uh, living and inflation from $90 <coughs> in 1991 to $675 in 2007, and now you're proposing to increase the fees even more. To me, it amounts to a poll tax because um, here we are encouraging people to participate in the American system as fully as possible uh, in the... Um, you know, in, in the days when we were encouraging people to vote, the, the poll tax became an impediment. And here, uh, having this high fee for the citizenship application is even even more of an impediment for them to uh, become a citizen. So, l so let me ask this. Um, I know that uh, we have uh, the, uh, the uh, relief of the fee for military members and asylees and, and refugees and uh, that in fact the, uh, the it is it's been determined that uh, there is a seventy two dollar surcharge to to recover the costs associated with asylum and refugee services in reality you're putting the burden on all the applicants to pay for that surcharge correct uh, yes but um, that would be absent um the appropriation that we uh, obtained in fiscal year 2010 and what we are seeking in additional appropriated funds in fiscal year 2011 to relieve other uh, fee paying customers of the surcharge um, to so that we can afford uh, to service the refugee and asylee community. Well, I actually have a question about that because uh, Last year, the president requested $206 million to fund this processing, but Congress only appropriated $55 million, so it didn't cover the cost of it. And we have, um, and we have requested a greater appropriation for fiscal year 2011 to indeed cover that gap. What was the actual cost in 2009? I'm sorry? What was the actual cost in 2009 for that uh, processing? Uh, Congresswoman, I would have to um, get back to you on the precise cost. And what is it that you're requesting for 2011? I believe it is um, just over $200 million. And would that uh, cover that cost 100 percent? I believe it would. I, I certainly would encourage us to, to fund that and not put that burden on the rest of the persons who are trying to become U.S. citizens. The other issue I have that I hear from advocacy organizations is that um, in, pa in the past, the fee review process has been a closed process with little transparency. And it's been a mystery to, to many who could see, foresee some things. For instance, who could foresee that there would be a surge of, of applications before the last fee increase. Um, and yet it seemed like uh, there was little um, uh, readiness to, to deal with it at the time. Um, so what, what could be done this time to make the process more transparent um, and to make sure that there's more community and congressional input with regard to the fee increase this time? I, I appreciate that question a great deal, Congresswoman, and if I may uh, speak to an example of what already has been done. Uh, when I arrived uh, at the agency and first learned that there was even a prospect of a fee increase, ever mindful of, the, um, uh, of what the communities uh, endured with the uh, 2007 fee increase, I um, traveled around the country and met with community groups and community stakeholders to inform them of the potential, to inform them of the issues that our agency was confronting with respect to its financial challenges and the different possibilities uh, that were before us in terms of addressing those financial challenges. And so I met with the communities 
in Chicago, in Los Angeles, in New York, uh, in Texas, uh, and elsewhere. And so one thing that um, we will, we, we have most certainly achieved in terms of the four pillars of which I spoke <coughs> at the outset was greater transparency. I believe we have made tremendous strides with respect to all four pillars. Uh, one that is, I think, receiving um, tremendous public accolades um, is, in fact, our increased transparency. We stood up in September of 2009, but one month after I first arise, arrived, an Office of Public Engagement that is dedicated to engaging with our stakeholders in the most encompassing sense to inform them of the challenges that we have and to capture the issues and concerns that they have with respect to our performance, our past performance, and our future. Gentlelady's time has expired. Uh, we have five minutes left on the clock. Mr. King has indicated he has gone to vote, which is reasonable. Uh, I would now recognize uh, our colleague, Ms. J Jackson Lee, for up to five minutes, but we don't want to miss this vote. So. Uh, let me thank uh, the witnesses and um, pointedly will focus my uh, questions and points on two areas. Um, this past weekend, we uh, witnessed an amazing um, exhibition of, I think, hundreds of thousands. Uh, it was represented to be 100,000 plus uh, who came to ask the question about comprehensive immigration reform. The federal government will be a key player uh, in the work of this Congress. And so my question is uh, to um, the uh, uh, Director uh, Mayorkas about the preparedness of your agency for uh, the possible passage of comprehensive immigration reform. And then to uh, Frank Deffer on this question of the uh, transforming the system to electronic. I cannot imagine if we pass comprehensive, comprehensive immigration reform, what a paper system will do. Uh, so preparedness and uh, this whole idea of a pilot, I think we'll pilot ourselves into the 22nd century. And when are we going to find uh, the wherewithal to do electronic records? Uh, to director and then to Mr. Deffert. Madam Congresswoman, uh, many of the efficiencies uh, that we have engineered and implemented uh, in our agency uh, will serve us well in terms of our preparedness should <laughs> comprehensive immigration reform uh, pass and uh, should the reform that passes include a path to legalization for the approximately 11 million undocumented individuals in this country. Uh, interestingly, uh, the challenges uh, that um, uh, confronted us in the context of the tragic January 12th earthquake in Haiti uh, presented a um, um, dry run, if you will, as to how we respond uh, to a previously unforeseen uh, volume of work on an emergency basis. And I think it's a testament uh, to the uh, engineered uh, and implemented efficiencies that we had put in place that we were so ably and frankly nobly um, uh, address uh, that challenge. Uh, we, as an agency, uh, will be able to implement comprehensive immigration reform. Um, Congresswoman, um, thank you for that question. It's, it's actually um, one of the reasons we started looking at CIS five years ago is we were concerned that immigration reform would, uh, in effect, place 12 million more people into the system. And it was clear to us in 2005 that the systems and the processes could not handle it. It would be overwhelmed. And in fact, since then, USCIS constantly has been sort of in this cycle of, we have a backlog, let's get money, get rid of the backlog. And so in effect, adding 12 million more people to the system would be the, you know, the, the, the mother of all backlogs. And clearly to us, the systems could not handle it now. Um, it is, it is uh, the, the reason transformation has to address those processes, the underlying inefficient processes, and get systems in, in, in place that can get rid of the paper. But it's going to take a few years. So it's something for Congress to consider that when they implement this, 
they don't have a date that's too soon because it's going to take a while to get these systems that are properly tested and they meet requirements and they do the job in place. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, let me thank you very much. Uh, obviously, follow-up questions are warranted. That's absolutely will, right. Uh, but I will engage uh, with uh, both of you to really probe, and I hope that, let me just do this. Let me ask a question on the record. Uh, if you could provide this committee with a, a detailed um, uh, analysis uh, of the question, meaning here's what we have done in terms of the preparation for uh, the 12 men, I would appreciate a response in writing. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent question. Yeah, and I would, uh, as gentlelady yields back, I'd like to thank all the members and the witnesses, each of you. It's been uh, very helpful. Without objection, members will have five legislative days to submit any additional written questions to you, which we will forward and ask that you answer as promptly as you can so that they can be made part of the record. Without objection, the record will remain open for five legislative days for the submission of any other material. And we thank you again, and the he hearing is adjourned. Thank you very much.